Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the State of the Web. My guest today is Paul Calvano. He's a senior web performance architect at Akamai, and we're going to be talking about web transparency. In previous episodes, we've looked at tools like the HTTP Archive and Chrome UX Report, and Paul is here to tell us about how he leverages these tools to not just understand the web, but actually make it better. Let's get started. So Paul, thank you for being here. Thanks, Rick. It's great to be here. Tell us about what you do at Akamai. Sure. So, uh, so, so at Akamai, I work with a lot of our customers on some of their strategic performance initiatives. Uh, often, I'm brought in to help do a performance assessment of, uh, of a customer's website, um, try to help them understand where, where maybe they're, um, they're experiencing some of their performance delays, what we can do to help them, uh, what maybe their developers can do to, to, optimize, uh, to optimize things as well. And Akamai has a, two different product lines, major product lines. Uh, can you tell us about those? We have a couple of different uh, a couple of different offerings. So Akamai is uh, most people know us as uh, as, as the, the largest content delivery network, and we're, we, it certainly is. We ha we deliver about twenty to thirty percent of the world's web traffic. Um, it's a pretty massive network, two hundred forty thousand servers and twenty five hundred locations. But we we consider ourselves to be a cloud delivery platform. So we have we have a. Uh, we have the delivery aspect of it, where we're delivering, we're basically delivering content across the across the web to end users. But then we also have the ability to accelerate that content um, using a variety of different performance optimization strategies, and then secure that traffic by uh, by you know implementing uh, um, like WAF uh, and security filtering technologies as well as bot mitigation technologies. Uh, and then beyond that, we also have some some value added services. One of them is uh, is Mpulse, which is a real user measurement service that um, that we use to essentially track the performance of, of actual end users across, uh, across sites. Now, as one of HTTP Archive's biggest power users, you can get some interesting ways of mashing up both real user data with synthetic. Can you tell us about a couple of ways that you've done that? Sure. So uh, one of the first ways I've, I've, I went in, uh, and used HTTP Archive data, um, when, I, when I first learned about the ability to query it on, on BigQuery, is I was wondering we have like like what types of compression like like what what types of content are people compressing on the web so we have uh, a feature on Akamai called Last Mile Acceleration, and this feature um, gzip compresses resources for our customers if they did not already gzip compress them. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a fail safe for customers that didn't compress content, and we historically have done it based on con based on a couple of different content types: CSS, uh, text slash HTML, and uh, an application slash x dash JavaScript. When I saw this uh, amazing amount of data that we had available to us, I was wondering what can I, you know, what other types of content are being compressed. And when I was able to run that query, the results were a lot more than what we were actually using as our defaults. So we wound up expanding the defaults in our property manager uh, behavior so that when a user implements last mile acceleration, they, are, they automatically start off with uh, this, this longer list of defaults based on what we, what we captured in the HTTP Archive. Gotcha. So using HTTP Archive, you can see what should be compressed. Correct. And then from Akamai's side, you can ensure that those types of resources are compressed. Yep, absolutely. Now, uh, you've also done things with security, right? A couple of months ago, Doug Sillers wrote a really great post on the HTTP Archive discussion forums about cryptocurrency mining and the, its performance impact on the web. And if you visit a website that has a cryptocurrency miner, you'll, you'll definitely notice that not only does um, the performance of that page drag, but your entire computer just starts slowing down to a crawl because it's, it's just using as much of your CPU as possible. So when I saw that, um, we started working on, uh, I know that you and I and, and, and Doug started working on um, basically building out that, uh, that query so that we were able to detect a variety of different cryptocurrency miners. What I've been doing since then is uh, I'll, I'll actually run that query with every new HTTP archive release, but look, at, look specifically for Akamai customers that have cryptocurrency miners enabled on their site. Um, a lot of times um, I'm finding like one or two sites that have a cryptocurrency miner and then I go and I reach out to them and I let them know, hey, do you know you've got this on your site? And do you know the performance implications? And do you know how it got there? Because that may be a security implication, and it's uh, it's you know provided uh, um, you know some some really great insight into into you know in, in, into the content and the the content that maybe third parties might be um, putting on our customers' websites, and uh, it's just yeah, and and it's I found it to be very uh, very very useful to to you know have that insight to share with customers. 
Another thing on the security side is we, we have another service called Enterprise Threat Protector that enter, enterprises can use to uh, to secure their, uh, their their sites internally. So that uh, let's say a Someone that loads a web page doesn't, you know, load on like doesn't load content that, ha that that's known to serve malware. Um, I would actually use the enterprise threat protector um, data to parse the HTTP archive and, and look for sites that um, that we would have blocked with enterprise threat protector. And then I, I found actually found one that was an Akamai customer, but wasn't. Uh, but the site was actually like a typo squatting domain. And the, it was injecting malware onto the site, so I went up reaching out to them and said, and said, "Hey, you know, do you know about this?" And they didn't, and they were able to go and uh, um, go and you know work through their legal to see what they could do about it. It's amazing how you can actually like take this data, which is almost like emotionless and like not directly tied to a person or an experience, but you can take that back to Akamai and then start to reach out to your customers and actually see some real improvements on the web, making it safer, faster. It's great to see. Yeah, it's really it's really cool to be able to take that data source, take the output of that, and kind of correlate it with some of our data sources that give us the ability to to reach out to customers. I did that uh, also recently with uh, we we saw there was a zero day uh, exploit on a popular um, on, a, on a on a on a popular publishing platform, and as soon as I heard about that, like the the morning that it was it was released to the to the public, I I, I said you know I wonder if I can query uh, against the HTTP archive to find out who's actually using this particular um, this particular so server software. And then I looked for the ones that were Akamai customers. I very quickly joined that to a table of contacts, and we were able to go out and proactively reach out to people and say, hey, we believe that you're running the software. Are you aware that there's an exploit? And uh, it also enabled us to go and, and offer the, the ability to proactively patch the software for them via a web application firewall before the customer would actually, was it before some customers were actually able to patch it on their end. It's really, really cool uh, um, ability to kind of correlate that to customer data. So let's pivot to another data source. Uh, Google releases the Chrome User Experience Report, or CRUX for short, where it's another real-world uh, user measurement data set. Uh, could, how have you been using this data and uh, making Akamai customers' experiences better? Sure. So, so Akamai offers a service called Mpulse, which is a real user measurement service, and this allows our customers to see the performance of all, all of their users across all browsers and locations and experiences and pages and so forth. Uh, we also use it to correlate performance to business metrics. Um, I know Tim Cadlick was on here a few weeks ago. He runs a site called WPO Stats. And on that site, you can actually see a lot of uh, use cases for how performance benefits the uh, per performance benefits a company from a business perspective. A lot Conversion of, rates and ad revenue. Yeah, a lot of companies have talked about how they've improved performance, and they've seen um, they've seen advertising revenue increase. They've made they've made more money via higher conversion rates. Uh, Impulse is designed to help our customers achieve that uh, achieve those uh, objectives by correlating the performance to um, to the conversions and revenue. Not every customer uses a real user measurement service right now. Um, so a lot of customers uh, I found use a you know, variety of uh, you know, different, different techniques to understand the performance of their applications. Um, I've actually been showing customers, uh, the Akamai customers, the, um, some uh, Chrome user experience report data just to help them understand what their performance actually looks like to real users. Because uh, as you know, that you're actually collecting those real experiences from, uh, from, from Chrome browsers. And, um, and aggregating that so that we can see the you know, histograms of the performance. Some customers have actually um, implemented a real user measurement solution because, like Mpulse because of that. Um, and so it's actually kind of sometimes changed the direction of how people will monitor performance because they've seen how different it is from synthetics. And so I know that one of the things that we worked on uh, um, together um, was actually correlating the Chrome user experience report data to Mpulse data to try to see, hey, is this, is this data consistent? And what we found was that it was very closely aligned. Do you make any of this public through like a report or anything? So uh, the impulse data is is not currently published uh, externally. So our customers each have access to their um, to the to their performance data, and they use that to analyze their site's performance. Um, 
We used to have a report that we published called the State of the Internet Report, which sounds a lot like the State of the Web um, video. This report was a quarterly report that Akamai published that talked about connectivity across the web. So what was the uh, bit rate in, uh, in various different countries? What percentage of traffic were we seeing across the web and, and so forth? This was uh, something that has been on hiatus for uh, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, quarters. And we've actually been hearing from, from people that they, they want it back. So we have an initiative within Akamai to kind of reboot this. And one of the things that we're planning on doing is adding some, some impulse RUM data to it so that we can talk about how, you know, you know, how the web performs as well as how it's being used. Interesting. So what kinds of things have you learned, um, even if it wasn't published externally, digging into this data about how the web is built? The first time I actually started looking into the impulse RUM data as a, as a whole was around November when Firefox released the, the version of their browser called Firefox Quantum. There was a very strong marketing push about how performance was one of the newest features of the browser, which is actually really great to hear that performance is, is a feature. I upgraded the new version and I, I was like, wow, this is much faster than the previous version that I looked at. But uh, I wanted to quantify exactly how much performance improvement there was. So I started looking at the, uh, at the data and I wound up uh, summarizing the performance in a histogram. And that histogram showed the, the range of the experiences that, um, that users uh, had, uh, had received for a specific Firefox browser. And then I looked at the previous one and the, pre and, the, and the one before that and so forth. I was actually able to see that there was a 24% improvement in DOM content loaded time for the newest version of Firefox compared to uh, a few versions before that. And that there was actually a consistent improvement from, from every, every version release that was released in 2017. So there was a, there was a blog post I wrote about that on, uh, on Akamai's developer blog. I also did a, another investigation using Impulse data recently where I looked at, there's a large uh, power outage in Brazil. Um, so it affected millions of, uh, of, of customers. And we're hearing that it was mostly northern Brazil. But, uh, uh, and there was some really great research from Dyn that was published uh, that talked about the, you know, f from like looking at trace routes where the, w you know, which networks were failing to respond and were most likely part of that power outage. What I was able to do is go and look at every city within Brazil that we had traffic from, and I created like a sparkline visualizations for all of them where I, I can see what the number of page views per minute were from every city in Brazil. And I was very, very quickly able to see that it was, you know, a couple of cities within northeastern Brazil, traffic just dropped off instantly and started gradually coming back up. And it was really cool to, to be able to correlate that with, uh, with the RUM data and provide some of those insights. That's the, that's the type of thing that we're looking to incorporate into the new state of the state of the internet report. Oh, well, that's great. So one of the really cool things about the Chrome user experience report is that you can compare performance across websites, even outside of the ones that you control. What kinds of avenues does this open up for performance analysis, especially as you start connecting it with Impulse data? So with Impulse, our customers have access to their, their own data. So they're monitoring their websites and they can see the performance of their websites. Uh, one of the, with synthetic measurements, customers are able to look at the performance of not only their site, but their competitor sites. But they can't get the real user performance of their competitor sites because they don't have any instrumentation on those sites. And one of the things we've been hearing from our customers is they really want to understand how their, how, how their impulse data compares to their competitors. Uh, obviously, we can't share that, but the Chrome user experience report opens up some new possibilities there. So because this is a public data source that contains performance for, I think it's up to a million sites now? Three million. Three million, yeah. wow. Um, it, it's, you're almost certain to find um, any website that you want to find in there. And you'll be able to you know, get the comparative performance information. So one of the things that we're actually building into Impulse, uh, it's not there yet, but we're building it, is the ability to select a couple of different sites that you want to compare your performance to, uh, and then it will actually use Chrome User Experience Report data to, to show that, that, that performance comparison so that you can actually now see not only how your website performs with your data, but see how your website performs with, um, with data that is not your data. Competitors. Right. Industry, web as a whole. Correct. And, and you know, I, I know that you recently presented uh, a presentation uh, titled Not My Rum, and it's essentially exactly what that is, is, you know, you've got your rum data, but then here's not your rum data, which is from Google Crux. Yeah. Check it out. Link in the description. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you about the future of the web. What excites you about the direction that the web is moving? Oh, wow. Um, so that's, that's a pretty loaded question. 
I've been doing work on the web for a very long time. Uh, and one of the things that I, I constantly see is that things are, are, are changing constantly, but a lot of the, we're seeing a lot of similar trends. You know, if you think about the way mobiles evolved, 20 years ago we were talking about like WAP pages to serve simple versions of web content to feature phones. And then you know, years later we're talking about responsive web design, we're talking about content adaptation to you know, serve a desktop site but have a mobile version. And now we've got AMP. Things are constantly changing, but we're constantly trying to go for the same, the same goals, which are reducing the amount of bytes on a page, reducing the complexity of the page for, for mobile clients. And I think that as, as we're seeing mobile explode, you know, it's up, uh, upwards of 50% of, uh, of traffic for most sites. Is uh, there's, there's so much more opportunity to, to you know, optimize the performance of that, and I feel like we're just getting started. What kinds of things would you say to somebody who wants to get started, you know, analyzing this kind of data? Some of my colleagues will let you, they'll nerd snipe me and they'll ask me a question, and suddenly I'm doing six hours of research just because it's fun. Uh, but a lot of that just comes from being extremely curious and trying to trying to ask questions and answer them. And if you don't know how to how to answer them, look for help and try to find the right data sources. And I feel that a lot of a lot of it really just comes down to being curious and and, and just trying to problem solve. The data is there. There's there's community for analyzing the data and support for that. And uh, you know if if you're looking to get started in that, there's a you know, there's, there's a lot of support in the HTTP archive discussion forums, and um, you can you can do so much with it. Well, Paul, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So if you'd like to check out Paul's HTTP Archive presentation at Fluent Conference this year, we have a link to it in the description. Or if you'd like to keep the discussion going, leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.